so John Mark Reynolds, Dr. John Mark Reynolds uh, uh, is the president of St. Constantine School uh, in, in Houston, Texas, and uh, Hope uh, Reynolds is uh, also from that school, so the, the, she's teacher. And um, I've heard about the school first time at the conference of the on Orthodox education in uh, in uh, uh, Chicago, uh, Chicago area. And um, you gave a talk there, so it was very interesting to find out that there is a uh, growing uh, uh, school in, in Houston. So I'm very happy that you managed to come to Estonia. Uh, because we see lots of similarities, but also you know, lots of things which we would like to, to find out how you do things. Well, <laughs> we are learning from you. So, so and uh, John Mark has developed this system of dialectical education that uh, uh, they are also spreading to, to other schools. They have conference in summer where people from other schools, Christian schools and I don't know, Orthodox, yeah, non-Orthodox, so come times. in to, to learn. And uh, this is a school which is from kindergarten till college, so they offer college education as well. So something, something we can take up. Well, we're hoping, <laughs> we're hoping you do. Let me say, I, this has been a wonderful experience for Hope and myself, and we have learned a lot, and there are ideas that we'll take back with us, and we hope this is the first of several. Uh, so next time yeah. you have time to visit other schools. Yeah, that's school. that's right. We want to we want to keep learning. Uh, everything in the United States is new, and so we have much to learn uh, wherever we go. Uh, so hopefully we can bring some good ideas, and mostly we'll learn. Uh, and so it's not quite fair. Uh, today I want to be a little more informal. Uh, yesterday I tried to establish a philosophy of why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, I do have a paper that I could read, but I'd like to talk to you uh, about it and then take questions as we go. So if I say something and you think either from yesterday or before, when in the world I, I don't understand, we can stop, think about it. But let me briefly say how, oh, I'll make a loud noise, how I think education uh, should work or does work inside an orthodox context. Yesterday, I tried to show that from the East, when Athens, particularly the dominant Platonism, at the time of the Roman Empire, Platonism or Neoplatonism was the dominant idea in the ancient world. So lots of Greek philosophers, but at the time of Paul, if you met a philosopher, they were probably some kind of Platonist. Uh, Stoics and Epicureans, yes, but the dominant school was Platonism. When that ran into Paul, uh, the Judeo-Christian idea, it formed something new, uh, a dialogue between the two groups. And that's very unusual. Sometimes dominant religious ideas run into uh, contrary opinions and they crush them, they smash them, they get rid of them. Uh, sometimes uh, a religious idea will run into another idea and it will lose and disappear. But uh, Christianity remained in dialogue with the Greek world for its entire existence. And this set up an ability for Christians to be in dialogue with other ideas. We didn't have time yesterday to look at this, but when, for example, the Syrian church uh, was conquered by Islamic governments, which has remained the case now for hundreds of years, and will be the case for hundreds of years more, probably. Uh, the church was able to enter into dialogue uh, with Islamic governments. And you, the fruit of this is someone like St. John of Damascus, one of the greatest Orthodox writers who, because he was not in the Christian world, was able to oppose iconoclasm and to write in the caliph's court uh, about what he thought was going on, and there has been a continuous dialogue between Orthodox Christian scholars and Islamic scholars that exist to this day in Orthodox universities like the Balamand in Lebanon. The height of the civil war in Lebanon, <coughs> this is recent history, 1980s. What did the patriarch of Antioch do? He founded a university, an Orthodox university, but he didn't have the church control it. This is what we were talking about yesterday, 
while it's orthodox, it immediately hired in the mathematics department, for example, Islamic scholars. And they entered into, they started an Islamic Orthodox dialogue center inside the university. This is very true. Now, what is this? We have the truth inside of Christianity, uh, which we believe is true. We're not postmodern. We think there is truth out there and that we can more or less know it. But we're human beings, so seeing the truth is hard. There's a gap between the truth and our understanding of the truth or our application of the truth. Um, we've all known people who were right. They had the right idea, but by the time they got done talking about the idea, they had made the idea ugly. Uh, the truth didn't help them because it became detached from beauty. So we have ideas and they're not quite the truth. And we might have two ideas or come into contact with two ideas and both of them seem to have elements of the truth, but they conflict. The early Christian idea was to keep believing in the truth that it was there while holding these ideas in tension and wonderful English word, wondering about them. Wonder is wonderful. So it both in English indicates a sense of, uh, hmm, I'm not sure. But it's exciting and joyful not sureness, not cynicism and skepticism. Cynicism and skepticism can't have a school like this. This is an amazing place. And this school wasn't formed out of people sitting in a room thinking it can't be done or making fun of ideas. Cynicism and skepticism never gets anywhere. On the under, other hand, wondering, could we have a school? Could we have an orthodox school? Could it be excellent? Uh, what did things look like in the past and how can we build on that? Uh, how could that be applied today? Because, of course, we have technology like computers. We don't want to just do what was done in the past. That's wondering. Notice this occurs not just between religion and science, but within science, within religion, within every field, even within ourselves. Here's one thing I believe. Here's another thing I believe. How do they fit together? Sometimes we're too hasty to smash them together. Now, what does that have to do with our students and our kids? If I'm right, I think all of science was born out of this. That sounds like a big claim, but the scientific revolution came out of overwhelmingly Christian nations. And I think that this happened not because they were smarter than anyone else, but they had this tension. First of all, they believed there was truth, so it was worth looking for. Second, they didn't have one idea, let's say a religious idea, that they allowed to crush immediately any other idea, let's say that the earth moved, that seemed to contradict their religious idea. <coughs> now I know, uh, famously, that sometimes uh, Christian peoples did persecute Christian scientists. But that was uh, so famous because it wasn't the norm. If Christians had wanted to crush science, they certainly had the political and military power to do so. But in fact, it was at best a half-hearted effort. I had a friend who was a scholar on Galileo, uh, who was famously uh, prosecuted by the Catholic <coughs> Church for his beliefs. Notice his beliefs turned out to not contradict religion, but Aristotelian science. Uh, the church mostly waited, and what they discovered was, oh, okay, the earth moving, that's okay. We can be okay with that. There was a resolution. Uh, and my friend, who was a Galileo scholar, pointed out that mostly Galileo's imprisonment consisted of being sent to a palace. Uh, where he lived rather well and corresponded with his daughter, who was a nun. And my friend suggested that he too would like to be persecuted in this way if someone could find a palace in which he could live uh, and suffer uh, for science. 
So there were worse cases, and I don't mean to make light of it, but notice on the norm in the Orthodox world, for example, in Russia, you have many Nobel Prize winners uh, before the revolution, and even after the revolution, from the heritage uh, of an education that lived in the tension of wondering. Now, all of that sounds very good, but we have to live with real world students, at least we do in Houston. I mean, maybe in Estonia, every student is very highly motivated and comes to school ready to learn and change the world. Uh, and uh, we throw the dialectic in front of them and they win Nobel Prizes uh, starting in the fifth grade, but this is not true of us. Um, and I think, so now I'll say a very strong thing and you're not responsible for it. Um, particularly American culture, popular culture, which we have sadly spread all over the world, is, uh, and I apologize for that, uh, if I start apologizing for things Americans have done, it's going to take me a while, but uh, I wanna say, if this is right, at least American pop culture makes students incapable of doing it. So what is one of our first problems? A culture of entertainment and easy access to entertainment makes this dialectical tension hard for your students to live with. Now I'm going to get very, very, very basic. And we were a college that got tired of how bad high school was in the United States, so we started a high school. And then we noticed junior high wasn't very good, so we started a junior high. We got frustrated with elementary school, so we started one of those. And finally, we started a preschool, and I guess we're done. I, we can't go any lower. We're at three. Three is our youngest student. 26 is our oldest. We have a nursery for faculty. That's true. I guess our youngest student is zero, <laughs> or something like zero. Uh, our faculty, we have free nursery care uh, for our faculty, so they can keep... Uh, being part of our community. Um, first day of school, uh, four years ago, we bring the kindergartners outside and we've built a beautiful natural playground, a donor. We're not blessed like Estonia with, you, we look outside. Uh, if you wanted to build this in Houston, something as beautiful as this, I can tell you what it would cost. It would cost about $500,000. I know this just because to get this many trees in our area and anything like grass that you have here cost about $500,000. So we live in a swamp. Uh, and so we had to create like hills for kids to climb on uh, and things for them to do. And so we created this space for them to play in and had some athletic equipment out there. And we brought five-year-olds out and they stood in a circle around a ball and they said, what do you want us to do? And the teacher said, play. And they said, no, tell us what to play. Not even that well, of course, because they were five. And the teacher said, whatever you want. And they just stood there and finally one uh, child said, can we go inside and look at an iPad? <laughs> we, no, we have no iPads for you to look at. And, and they didn't know what to do. Now I can say four years later, if you come and look at that same group of kids, we have very extended recesses for a reason. They'll go outside immediately and they play games that they have organized themselves. Some of these games <coughs> are not the best. We had one group of students who got to the fifth grade and they were learning about the French Revolution. So they started playing French Revolution, the game, we had parents calling us and saying, why are our students sliding down a slide and being executed? At the end of this is, we brought this to an end, but uh, we laugh. But I, I will say for all the problems of that imaginative game, notice how much better and healthy it was that children went out and created their own working out of what they had heard in class and played in their own imaginative world than a group of students standing around a ball in a circle unable to do anything. So I want to suggest, 
Here's a, this is actually an English word, uh, edutainment, mm -hmm. that's come into very high prominence in uh, American educational circles. In, in positive sense? Uh, negative it's, sense. So it's used in negative sense. Yes, most of education and educational resources are becoming more and more edutainment mm -hmm. because we're in a culture of... <sighs> we need to skip to this right away. Boredom. And why? Uh, there are two ways of being bored. <clears throat> Light boredom and terminal boredom. <laughs> Light boredom, these are terms I've made up, so don't try to look them up. Light boredom is necessary for children to experience. Yeah, definitely. Terminal boredom, you see in college students for years. I'm talk I, I started uh, what is now the largest gifted and talented great books program in the United States. So if you want to read great books, uh, very large. Our biggest problem were 18 to 19 year olds who were very selective. They were in the top five, three to five percent of all American high school students. What was their biggest problem learning? If we asked them to do a hard thing, would they do it? Yes. If we gave them the hardest test we can imagine, would they get an A, pass it? Yes. They wouldn't have been there otherwise. Turned down half the students that applied. They were so bored with everything, including themselves, that they couldn't get motivated to do much of anything. They were burned out at 18. One student said, been there, done that. Huh. Now, they were going to go on being good, as American schools count good. And these were uh, often religious students. They, they weren't hostile. Do you understand? They weren't angry about anything. They didn't want anything. They were, eh. Once you get to this point, it's hard to help a student get better. And my suggestion is that in any school, K through 8, at least in the American context, and I expect here, you're facing the beginnings of moving from light boredom. What's light boredom? Adults leave you to entertain yourself and learn, and that's hard, and you conquer it. So I'm old enough that when I was a little boy in West Virginia, my mom would say on a Saturday after I did my work, the chores around the house, took care of the yard, go away, I'll see you when it's dark. And my brother and I would go out and play. And uh, this is around the time that I met someone from Estonia, very nearby, and became a friend. And I heard Estonian fairy tales, and they got very deeply embedded in my head somewhere. And so Daniel and I, that's my brother, invented an entire imaginary world somehow mixed up in all of this. Uh, it got uh, so important to me that I actually wrote a novel about it as an adult. Uh, now, as one of your students said, I bet you were a nerdy kid. And that's true. But notice whether that was the way your imagination worked, or your imagination worked in inventing baseball games. Uh, sports events, which I also did. I would go and throw a baseball against a wall and pitch whole games in my head because that's what I had to do. Now, was I excited about this when mom would kick me out of the house? No, I would rather have watched cartoons on television. Back in the day, only Saturday did you have children's cartoons. But mom said, no, go and amuse yourself outside. I faced light boredom, and what did I learn to do? Defeat it. Now notice, is it true, Americans have gotten so that they give their parents a phone around kindergarten to go to school. Children, give their children. They all have them, and is this a problem here yet? Does everyone have a smartphone? I 
First grade. First grade. First grade. I figured. I figured it was. I'm not a smartphone necessarily, but it's it often it is. Yeah. Oh, it's so here's a suggestion about this, mm -hmm. right, whatever it does for adults. Mm -hmm. um, you'll notice, and this is a good thing, I'm not putting this down. I came on this trip, and every talk I've given, including this one, uh, though I'll try not to uh, list all of them, there might be 10, 15 books that I'm using to make these points. And I used to bring them with me in case I wanted to freshen up or know what I was talking about or just because facing such educators is very nerve wracking. You know, you want to make sure you know what you're saying. Um, I now have them all here. The books. The books. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I have hundreds of books on my Kindle device that I can look at any time. And I have streaming from the States. We could have if we had wanted to. Of course, that would have been a huge waste of time watched our normal television programming from our phones. In fact, any time I feel light boredom, what can I immediately do with this device? Get rid of it by consuming easy entertainment. I don't know what this does to adults, but I think the research is clear and my own observation is clear. What this does is prevent <coughs> children from learning to master light boredom themselves so that they become young adults who are already burned out. Um, notice that rising affluence of entertainment is also part of this. What do I mean? When my grandfather was a little boy in West Virginia, and West Virginia is one of the poorest areas of the United States, so it's maybe 50 years behind the cities. So when my grandfather was a little boy, there was no electricity, there was no radio, there was no nothing. I mean, radio hadn't even been invented, really, when he was the littlest boy. And so he could not possibly hear any music that somebody didn't make. So hang with me, this seems very abstract, but I want you to think about this for a minute. If my grandfather wanted to hear music, what did someone have to do? Play. Yes, or sing. So there was always in these little towns, and they were very poor, one church or one house that could have a piano. And young women, in particular, were all taught to play the piano, if they could at all. Why? Because they wanted to be scholars or grow up to be concert pianists? No, because if you wanted music in the evening, or for a holiday, or in church, you had to make it yourself. And so even before my family came from a town so poor, we couldn't afford pianos. So when I was, well, how did they make music? The towns, my great grandfather had a pitch pipe, which my dad still has. And he would make a sound and everybody in the congregation would sing. Wonderful harmonies. These songs, by the way, have almost entirely disappeared. When I was very, very, very little, I would go to old churches, and old men in their 90s would stand up and sing songs that were really, because of the area, kind of Irish, Celtic sound from the mountains of West Virginia over hundreds of years. What happened the minute radio came to that folk music? It was obliterated. <clears throat> It disappeared because instead of making music live, you could listen to um, preserved music. So <coughs> for almost all of human history, music was live. My wife plays the trumpet. If I wanted to hear a trumpet played, I went and listened to a trumpet player. 
Our students today almost entirely think of music as a preserved thing, streamed from some other group. Books were in some ways the first preserved technology. Instead of listening to Plato himself, you could read a book by Plato. And notice that, doesn't, that means preserved isn't bad. Books aren't bad, recordings of music aren't bad. We went to the wonderful concert last night, Hope bought CDs, we'll listen to them. But pause, for my students, it's getting harder and harder to get them to go to a concert like last night because their, all, their music experience isn't just preserved, it's in their own heads. It's totally isolated. Now, don't think good, bad. Some of this is good, but notice it's become all of it. And the liveness has disappeared. Now, have you ever taken a child to a live concert? What happens to them right away? Yes. And if you wake them up, they get antsy, squirmy. They face. Whereas if you're, if you're using preserved music, a child or a young adult can do a soundtrack to their life. The minute they don't like what the musician is doing, it challenges them musically. What can they do? Advance. You can't do that in a concert. Last night, brilliant people forced me to listen to a program that they had thought through. And the program itself, as I looked at it, taught me. What could I skip? There were some songs I was very interested in. For example, making the genealogies, the begats of the Bible, interesting. This was really exciting to me. And if I had had control, I might have skipped songs to get to that song, and I liked it so well, what might I have done? You repeated it. Now, this isn't evil, but notice if you have almost all of this and almost none of this, that has an effect, and it's similar to the effect of edutainment. Can you define that? It's this effect. The minute I have light boredom, I get rid of it through heavy entertainment. I never have to create my entertainment or learn to find enjoyment in something more difficult because what can I do right away? Change the sound. Don't want to listen in class? If I can sneak my phone in, I can play a game. Feel a little tired? Let me watch a YouTube. Now, I want you to notice what this has done to attention spans. Most movies are now too long for the attention span of young adults. Most video is consumed in the United States for very young adults in a medium called TikTok where the videos are about 10 seconds long. They deliver whatever message they have in 10 seconds. Now, is that bad? No. But imagine this. What if your attention span becomes about that before you reach terminal boredom? Could you explain the history of Estonia and the complexities of it in any number of TikToks. No, you could not. Could you reach the higher music that we heard last night, the difficulty of it? I'm married to a musician and I've listened to difficult music since we got married. When we got married, she took all my really bad popular music and threw it in the trash can and said <laughs> that I had to do better. And so I've had to do better since then. I've learned. Uh, notice the complexity, even the pleasure that comes from that experience can only come by growing up. It was the point of growing up. 
When I was a little kid, my favorite food was sort of sugary cereals that were, had no subtlety to the palate, right? They just exploded in your mouth with sweetness. Part of the joy of growing up is learning to like better food. The joy of growing up is to like more difficult music. The joy of growing up is to move from easy literature to something uh, like the Brothers Karamazov that you could read the rest of your life and never come to the end of it. I've been working on the first line of Plato's Republic for 30 years. And in fact, my mentor, uh, it makes me cry, just passed away. And yes, and uh, my professor. And my professor and I would talk about the first line of the Republic and the last line, actually, to try to understand it for 25 years. This is very deeply happy, but it isn't a happiness you can get to from this state. These things are neutering our students against actual education. So what can a school do? This is what you want to know. I, I hope you, I have persuaded you of a problem. But notice, notice that this is not a problem of atheism. This is not uh, the problems that we sometimes talk about in Christian uh, ed higher education. I think this is a deeper and more important problem. Mm -hmm. Because the liturgy itself in the Orthodox Church isn't going to change for you. It isn't a TikTok. You go to the liturgy in the cathedral and it demands adultness of you. You go and you go and you go and you learn and you learn and you learn until you find pleasure, deeper pleasure. Uh, so what do we do? Here are some practical suggestions. First of all, we have to assume that our students are well on their way to this process and do everything we can to move them away from a culture of entertainment. That means the kind of rigorous schooling I see here is very essential. In the United States, more and more, we're letting um, what students want guide our curriculum. And we're meeting the students where they're at, which in a way you have to do, rather than calling them up to a higher standard. Uh, this is to play into the problem. Uh, so here are three practical suggestions not to do that. As much as possible at the St. Constantine School, we do not use screens. I know I'm giving my talk from a screen, but I lived before screens were prominent, and I think it does me less harm. But for small children, we move as much education to this. Because we started right away, K through 12, in college, and we noticed our high school students were sitting in a room with each other and not talking. They were texting each other in the room. Now, this was not because they were saying shocking things they didn't want us to hear. We weren't even there. It was because they no longer, and it, it may not be true of Estonian children, so we may have decadent children, uh, but it's coming. If he's here. All right, good. I don't want to say yeah, something. Is, yeah, well, this is what is important. There are no phones allowed in our school. If we see them, we take them away. Uh, we have parents that want to, for safety, or because they think their child will get behind, uh, who will send their children uh, to school with a phone. And we don't confiscate them. You can have different rules. What we say is, if we see it, we take it away. And then we have an office space where the children, or the adults, the college students, can go and utilize their device with permission to call home or do whatever they need to do. In go America, ahead. Parents are uh, bringing children in school and taking them away. Our children are going in school independently. So that usually we allow them to have telephone, but it's with this uh, uh, simple telephone. Yes. yes. That to not be lost or that to have a contact. 
and but even see select uh, telephones they have to put in the box at the beginning of the day and to take them when they are going away. I, I strongly like if anybody if you need support to do this and you probably don't uh, use me because I urge everyone to do that sort of thing. Whatever version of that you do, that is just right. Mm -hmm. And with our parents, I have actually experimented with what are called dumb phones, that they have no camera. Cameras are very dangerous for students, by the way. To have a camera is to be in danger if you're a, a younger uh, child uh, because of what you can do with a camera. And as a child, you don't know what to do with a camera. Uh, giving a child a camera to walk around with all day is a very bad idea. They learn quickly. They do. And whether they learn or not, their friend does. And so your child uh, may be innocent and not think of things, but the child next to them. There are in the United States what are called dumb phones, which only make phone calls. Mm -hmm. And they can receive texts, but they're very difficult to text on. So if you need to text your mom or call her, you can, but you would never want to use it all day because it's, it's difficult to use, it's not attractive. It, it has a black and white screen and has no internet connection. We encourage our parents, if they must get their child a phone, for safety reasons, to get that phone, to get a phone like that. So the first thing is, but even our education, we need to move away from light, entertaining lessons to lessons that call our children up to a higher plane. Now, this school already does that in many ways. So what do you do with a kid that just won't, that's stubborn? Um, sometimes I sit and talk to children that are old enough, let's say by fifth grade, and they start to become this way. Uh, our teachers will sit and explain what's happening to them. And believe it or not, kids can understand more than you believe, and you try to help them choose not to fall into this trap. That you're not just being opposed to technology or to phones. You don't, there are good things about it. But too much of a good thing is too much. We're going to have to, because of the world they live in, begin to try to dialogue, even with fairly young kids, and explain why we're doing what we're doing and why it's so important that, yes, they even be a little bored and that they make their own games. I was so happy here to see when we came, children out in the playground supervised by faculty, but not being told what to do by faculty. Because of lawsuits, more and more in the United States, our children aren't allowed to play unsupervised games. We tell them what to do. We organize a soccer game, or we organize games all the so, time. Uh, you can't play if it's not... Yes, that's correct. There are almost no American schools that have recess. Almost none. Is it because of some incidents? Um, in the United States, uh, so our bishop came to visit, Bishop Basil. And there were two boys wrestling out in the field. They were just wrestling. They weren't angry. And a mother came up to the bishop and said, Ah, oh, these two boys are wrestling in the field. And the bishop said, that's great. That's, oh, it was such a relief to me. And he went away. In most American schools, uh, for fear of a lawsuit from one of the parents, that would have been stopped immediately. Mm. But the boys weren't angry. Mm. They, they weren't hurting each other. Our playground rule is when one person is unhappy, stop. They were having a good time. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I, I know that it's happening in the UK too. What I'm saying is usually when we catch a cold, everyone else gets pneumonia eventually. So what's coming is more and more supervised activities to the point that now my wealthier parents schedule their child's day from the time they get up in the morning to the time they go to bed at night with wholesome activities. They're not evil activities. And what I'm telling you is that's killing children, mm -hmm. mentally. It's edutaining them to death. Mm -hmm. So what the schools need, I see that your school does, is oftentimes K through six in particular for supervised but unrestricted recess. 
And in a natural environment, yes, with the exception of soccer goalposts, this is mostly true. Um, in America, we have more and more playground equipment that is designed to have three or four play pads. Does this make sense? Like, all right, uh, in our playground, uh, we built a mountain, little mountain, it's about uh, this high, uh, and inside of it is a cave. Uh, you can see inside of it. Yeah, it's built into it. Uh, notice, we don't tell kids what to do with it. And there are almost infinite numbers of things you can do with it. Uh, we have one little thing that's a hole in the middle of a hill. And the children have turned it into a dragon's mouth, which they do all sorts of games around. And next year it will be something else. And it probably isn't even that, right? I, I can't keep up with what the small ones are doing. Um, the stuff we build, it's like the trees out here. You play with them in hundreds of different ways. They're just there. Uh, on the other hand, there's nothing wrong with it. A slide tends to have one play path designed by adults. By the way, what do children immediately do with something like a slide? They do different things with it than the makers intended. So uh, weirdly, they're less safe than just a tree because they start doing things with them they weren't intended to be done. Uh, and so it's strange. So as much as possible, even our playground equipment must uh, be natural and unlimited, have unlimited play paths, stimulate the imagination without constraining it to do one thing. Could I ask you? Yeah, please. So this, uh, um, I, I kind of follow your uh, um, uh, logic, but according to this, you would uh, uh, try to bring the same element into the uh, into teaching in a school, not just like research. So yes. Like, so would you do that, uh, or would it be more? <coughs> or would it be like a contrast between more structured time at school and like non-structured, you know, outside? Yes, that is in fact precisely right. Uh, the strength then, I mean, you walked around and saw the classrooms here, just so. Uh, the strength <coughs> for younger kids is, I, so this, I, I don't want to be offensive, and it's not like I know much about music, but let me try something in the American context. In the American context, we used to have music classes where we taught kids to like music that was better than they liked naturally. So you have pop music, and then we had music classes where you had to take an instrument or you had to learn higher, better music. So sometimes when I say that in the American context, people get mad at me, but I hope nobody gets mad at me here. Uh, and they call me an elitist, and I'll, it's terrible. Um, my suggestion is in class, we uh, teach higher things as much as possible. And we do as little edutainment as possible but here's bad news. Your students won't like it at first. Like they really won't like it because it's going against the entire consumer culture. Every commercial on television, every bit of television programming, every bit of music, every bit of streaming, every bit of the internet is designed for what? Clicks. Fourth bad element. A culture of clicks. Does this make sense, uh, a culture of clicks? Uh, it used to be to even be a celebrity meant you were a movie star or something. Uh, now the goal is to be famous for being famous by drawing attention. It can be even bad attention. Uh, so it's a culture of celebrity as the chief value. Yeah. Now, uh, this is not a political statement. I want to say this again. I am not making a political statement. So listen to what I'm saying carefully. In 2012, I was giving early form of this lecture. And I said, in the last several presidential elections in the United States, I don't care who you wanted to win, the person with the highest celebrity rating in the United States won. 
It didn't matter if they were liked or not liked. Uh, we actually rate people by celebrity. Uh, and what does celebrity mean? The most famous person in the United States is someone that everyone from about zero to 100 has heard of. Does it matter whether they've heard of them positively or negatively? No, there's a rating scale. Mm -hmm. And so in 2012, I said, if he decides to run for president, Donald Trump, and immediately the classroom was so loud with laughter that I couldn't finish my sentence. And I said, no, no, you have to stop. Donald Trump has 99% name recognition in the United States. If he decides to run for president, I, I can't believe he would win, but he will be a formidable candidate because all of this leads to this being the most important thing. If you want to keep a republic, this is hard to do. Um, by the way, who is the only American at that time who is more famous than Trump? Mm. Oprah Winfrey, mm. who's an African-American television personality. Immediately after Trump won, the Democratic Party naturally tried to get Oprah Winfrey <laughs> to run for president. And in one way, that's insane. And in another way, that makes sense, right? If you look at the current primaries in the United States and you simply said, who's the most famous person? You can generally tell who will win. Do you see how all of these things come together? So what you have to do in your school is move away from respect for celebrity and towards respect for accomplishment. Well, it's interesting. I don't think our children have uh, so much celebrity uh, culture. That's very good. That's and encouraging. I, I was surprised myself because I was trying to make, motivate them a little bit, you know, to learn the language by the entertainment. Mm -hmm. And I kind of realized that they're not really interested. I said, well, look, I mean, there was a, a video which was very popular in one of the, kind of the top-rated video yeah. in, in, in Russia, I mean, uh, YouTube, and I thought, okay, we'll watch it because it's from Russian. And then we discuss it, and at least they would be motivated. And I, I realized they were not, and it was about the celebrity, and they just didn't seem to be particularly... So I think it's something about that school, but I'm sure other schools might be... Um, it also uh, could be that you're not as far down the, the road of decay as we are. Remember... No, I, I think it's, it's everywhere. It's or, true. or it just wasn't their kind of celebrity. Yes. <laughs> all right, you pick, pick the wrong celebrity. Uh, so, but all I can say is, you have a hard task. But my experience is that if we explain what we're doing openly to students, here's one thing you have going for you. Uh, I lived in Los Angeles, and so I'm able to say to my Houston kids, I knew the people who made uh, most of the movies that you see. And they don't let their own kids watch them. Not because they're evil, but because they don't want their kids to amuse themselves to death. They raise their kids in very traditional ways, very often. So I will say this, most children right away realize they're being sold something and are a little cynical about that. And if you point that out and help them uh, get to quality, uh, we can also conquer. But here's what we're going to have to do. We can't placate these desires at all in class. We have to accept the fact that we will produce what? Light boredom. And look, I'm a teacher. I want you to be entertained. I, I hope I'm communicating to you. I want to help you. I want to learn. I'm not talking about intentionally being boring. And I've never met a teacher who wanted to be. But we have to accept that in a culture that's treating kids this way, a good thing we can do is make them take a hard math class that they may not love, or learn piano, or learn difficult music that, that really is, uh, I sang well enough to be in a church choir, but I wasn't going to be a singer like we heard you know, by a long shot. 
But my parents forced me to take vocal music lessons and learn to sing better and more difficult music when I was in school. Did I like this? No, I did not. I would have preferred playing soccer. Uh, and I played soccer too, but I would prefer just you know, doing things with my friends. It's obvious that this benefited me long term. More and more, our parents are struggling if their child resists difficulty. And so in some ways, we have to educate our parents first in this problem so that they'll stick with us. Now, I'll give you one danger that's inside of it. Often we can persuade our parents to stick with us because we persuade them that the hard tasks we're doing will help their kid make more money, get into a better college, and get a better job. This is true, in fact. This school, if you teach children to read well, write well, think well, and be able to entertain themselves and create instead of consume, mm -hmm. you know, more and more, what I loved is we went upstairs, I watched things. So many things students made were out for us to look at. The art I take it on the program was made by a student. Mm -hmm. Create everything at your school. Buy almost nothing. Um, the one-room schoolhouses of West Virginia that my grandparents went to, and my great-grandparents and my great-grandparents, and for 400 years, produced great men and women often because they had very little. Who made the schoolhouse? The people, the parents. With the exception of the few books they had, every single thing in the school was made by the school. You know, you might have bought a slate and chalk at the school, but almost everything else was created by the teachers in the school. Now, we don't want to go back to that. We don't want to make our own piano. But in our school, for example, our college students, when they did a play, instead of buying a play, our school wrote a play and premiered it, our college. Now, it's, it's not Shakespeare. But we can go down the street and see Shakespeare by professionals. And our students get so little chance to create that from kindergarten on, if we have a choice between buying it and making it, what should we do? Make it. Now, notice that we usually don't have money, so we have to make it anyway. But that's a strength of our private schools. In many ways, I've seen this happen. Private schools in the United States that suddenly get a windfall of money from the government or someone else will become educationally inferior to what they were before because they start solving their problems how? With money instead of the creativity of people. Uh, let me give you an example. My son was given the task by his father, uh, that's me, uh, to run a winter camp and to uh, educate a group of students who had no childcare over our long Christmas break. Uh, unfortunately, we had no money to give my son to run the winter camp. So what did he have to do? He went and got cardboard from, uh, if you'll pardon me, liquor stores, because they always have large cardboard boxes or grocery stores. And he and his girlfriend, who's one of our college students, uh, opened up all the boxes so that they would have paper, and they slowly made shields uh, for each student that they then painted with paint he just gathered from around. And then they organized themselves, and he taught them to march like a Greek phalanx and explained to them Alexander the Great. Now, I'm not sure how educational this was, but the children had a great time they learned something, and it was a making, and so it was authentic. Now, in the United States, here's the mistake we would make. We would say, that's a really good idea, Ian Reynolds. Let's package what you did and make professional shield kits that we can send to everybody so they too can have Alexander the Great Day at their school. Well, this would be a terrible idea. All that would be is edutainment. 
But when Ian Reynolds, who as a little boy became fascinated with Alexander the Great, read everything he could about them, brought his passion to the students, he actually did educate them about Macedonian culture, and they did something together that was authentic in a community that made something that was in one sense entertaining at a deep level, but was authentic to us. Now, I'm sure a school here does things like this, but we have to double down on those things. Um, Estonian schools need to be more Estonian. Houston, Texas schools need to be more Houstonian. And then we look at each other and learn from the diversity while we are who we are, not just some kind of homogenized international project that mostly comes from buying things. So let me pause because I, I can get ever more practical and that's probably, I, here's, here's, you're going to have to almost try to make your kids bored. When you have kids that are bored in this light way, you should applaud yourself. You're saving them. But you have to talk to your parents about this yeah. and explain what you're doing and get them to buy in. Our parents buy in. Yeah. Well, we don't have to do really a program for them during the class. Uh, Good. Because uh, it's just, uh, I mean, of course, yes, if you see children in the class, you know, doing like this, it's, <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> it is for them. Yes, I, I agree with that. I think it's the problem of after school, you know, when ch parents are still at work, the children have completed their homework uh, or haven't completed, and then they just play, you know, with, yeah. the, with the gadgets. And that's uh, <coughs> just very typical because. They, it, it's safe, you know, like they are actually at home, they're not going astray, they're not somewhere. Yeah. So parents know where they are, they can actually yeah. see on yeah. their phones. So, so uh, I can tell you what we did. And unfortunately, this fell on my son, Ian Reynolds, again. So I apologize to Ian. Um, we created an after school program that parents pay a little extra for. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have, for small ones, supervised play but it's usually outside in all kinds of weather. And let me say, Houston, about six months of the year is 90 degrees and 100% humidity. I'm not exaggerating, and it rains a lot. We do not have, you know, we're not Southern California. Our kids are outside every day. Our parents are told, send mud boots. You know, and, and like downstairs, you take your shoes off and expect your kid to come home dirty. And so on any given day, Ian Reynolds and you know, his team will take the groups of students out because what, what we don't... What is the ratio of teacher and students? Um, that's a good side? question. It's about 1 to 15. 1 to 15? Yeah, because, yes, uh, because what we're not doing is telling them what to do. Mm -hmm. What we are doing is telling them what they can't do. They can't. Mm -hmm. They can't be consuming media. That's the one thing they can't do. They also can't hurt each other and, and do evil things. But, you know, we don't have a big problem with that. Uh, the older kids, notice something. If the older kids are sitting over there chatting with each other and the boys are kind of chatting with the girls, this is a big improvement. Because when our students began, no, because we had all ages, right, right away? Our teenage boys did not know how to talk, and I don't mean in a normal way, they didn't know how to talk to teenage girls. Mm -hmm. And teenage girls didn't know how to talk to them. Mm -hmm. Because my looking at you mm -hmm. and having a conversation really uh, freaks them out. <laughs> so notice that uh, it would, someone would say, like when I was a young man, what a waste of time. You're, you're letting these people sit over there in that corner and talk. Notice from our point of view, that's a big improvement from three years ago when they sat like this. Yeah, yeah. So in one way, if you think about what they have access to on this, mm -hmm. they're not safe at all. But what about yeah. uh, uh, that's, uh, like when, when the teenagers, for example, use the need that this uh, media for uh, social activities, so they like watch something together and then they talk about it and. Then Yes, um, that's a good question. I notice, and I really always have to tell my students this. First of all, I enjoy my smartphone. I even play a game on it that I play every morning for a little bit of time. And I tell, mostly I do that so I can tell my students that I do it. Uh, 
And, and I enjoy it. Uh, Star Trek timelines. It tells you how old I am. Uh, <laughs> but then I can say that to students. Look, it's not evil what they're doing, and there's a lot of good about it. I, I have former students that I can keep track of on Facebook that I started teaching when I was 20. And so I had a student from my first year of class who wrote me this year, two years ago, and said, I'm having my fifth grandchild. And I think they thought that I would be happy, but it was really, uh, oh no, I'm very old. <laughs> I realized, uh, but I was happy, right? That's a good thing to keep in contact with people. But I will tell you this, we don't let them plan events like that on school using social media. We, we communicate to parents that way. You know, we have a school Facebook page and anytime I leave, uh, something terrible happens. So down the street, the entire water main uh, was hit by a truck. And so all the water in our area became uh, polluted. So the whole school had to boil water the whole day. And all the parents are already afraid of the virus that's coming. And so this ha always happens when I'm gone. Something like this occurs. Sorry. Uh, but I have a good team and, and they were fine. Uh, but we communicated with our parents right away, you know, through social media and through a text alert, and that's all very good. But in the school, we force our students to do it the old-fashioned way because they're already going to learn how to use this whatever we do. And we don't mind their learning to use it. We want them to, but we don't have to teach it. What do we have to teach? The, yeah, no, no. The great virtue of Christian schools for this age is uh, sofra sune, um, gentlemanly behavior, moderation. Yeah, moderation. Uh, also, uh, sufficiency. I wonder if it's yes. to kind of view the relationship, because of course everything's a balance, and I think it all got see, like to see a balance. But if we think of our children, um, think about the machine, you know, the machine is a bit like candy. Yes. So, I mean, I reflect on my own child and I think, like, what, what my parents did that really helped, like, with candy, we'd have, like, five pence on a Saturday, we'd have to wait to anticipate receiving this five pence, and then we'd go to the shop and get the, the kind of the sugar fix for the week. Yeah, and it's fine. The, week. the same with television, like, my mother would, um, we'd have the radio times, so we'd have to look at which program we wanted, she would then turn on the TV at the appointed time. At the end of the hour, she would turn off the TV, respective of whether we wanted to carry on watching. It was like we had a shared decision. This is what we want to watch. And then she would be the kind of, mod, you know, on it goes and off it goes. Then obviously our culture, this is like in the 1970s, 80s, now has like progressed and TV's on all the time. And now we have these screens with us 24 seven. Mm -hmm. So like our generation, like, you know, in this room, we, from our own experience in childhood, have learned, you know, now I look at the phone, now I don't, because it's right. my experience through television. But the children growing up these days, it's internet is, is their reality, 24-7, screens it in their face, 24-7, and we, we can't assume that they have the same capacity to regulate their responses. No, we they don't. We have to teach them that. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I'm really interested in many of the themes of what you've touched on, because it reminds me of a spiritual father in Edinburgh called Father Raphael, who is working with the parents in the Orthodox community there, <coughs> really encouraging the parents that we have to start with ourselves. Yes. Like we, and you have to forgive me here, because I'm a psychologist, I think a lot about this in terms of social learning. Like, we learn through watching each other. This is what Vygotsky tells us. We copy each other. The children copy everything we do. Yeah, but Miriam, we are using the devices for work and they're using sure. for entertainment. There is a difference. Of course, but what I'm saying is, if a child sees us on our phone a lot, young child, yet, natural, so. they want to do the same. Yeah. So, I mean, I was very inspired. I mean, I'm not suggesting this is for everybody, but this one particular Orthodox spiritual father, he suggests to the parents with children under five not to ever show them you're on the phone. Now that's, that's quite hard, and I'm not suggesting I'm being provocative here because I'm pushing the extreme, but I'm trying to bring some also shared responsibility that we have in this dynamic. I'm not suggesting this is the, the way we should be, but that's a huge discipline to, do, to, to raise a child up to the age of five and never let the child see you on a device. That's, I'm not, you know, I have a huge admiration for any parent who can do that. So I have a friend, she goes into the toilet 
The only time she reads her text messages is when she's in the toilet. Now, you have to respect that. Mm -hmm. You have to respect, because I mean, we all would know the challenge for us as individuals. But whether you go to this uh, length or not, the lesson is very interesting, because actually what those children are learning is they have the undivided attention of the parent. Of course, of course, it's good for children not to have full attention of parents. Children need to also like tolerate some frustration, like I can't get you know, parent attention, how can I get your attention back? But it's a balance, isn't it? Because they always have to compete with us on the machine. I just, I'm so aware of how pervasive machine is now in our, in our culture. Uh, only pause, can. only and pause. children now have to compete with the machine for <coughs> our attention. However we do this, I only pause and say that as recently as when I earned my PhD at a secular school in the 90s, I had no access to technology of the sort we're talking about, mm. but somehow managed to do a full education. And clearly our finest schools somehow produced fine people, including many of the people in this room, with no access to the technology we now view as essential. So we do have to pause and say, how much is convenient at a cost and how much is essential? I want to repeat, I am sitting in front of two devices. I am not a Luddite, right? I am not opposed to the proper use of technology, even as entertainment. The fact that when I prepare to teach Shakespeare, I can now easily access many versions of even obscure Shakespeare plays and watch them. Or I can choose to watch obscure movies of the sort I love. When I couldn't as a young person, I had to choose what society gave me. It's, it's a blessing. But notice, blessings can become curses when they become immoderate. Um, the only thing that I'll say, that these are just facts as far as we can tell, I have yet to re read a survey by a psychologist that says that more than an hour of screen time is good for children. The biggest number I've seen, and I mean any kind of screen use, TV, video streaming, internet gaming, all of it about an hour. An hour a day. An hour a day. After an hour a day, look, it's very correlation and causation, I'm a philosopher, they're very hard to show. After about an hour a day, there's a remarkable, remarkable increase in depression, isolation, and loneliness. Now, what's the good news about young adults in America and this problem? If you become screen-oriented, most of the bad behaviors that people worried about in my generation, drug use, uh, promiscuity, and sexual activity, uh, violence, are those going up or down in the United States in young adults? Going down. They're plummeting. By every measure, yes, young adults, my college students, are enormously better behaved than I was mm. because they're sort of trained mm. and isolated. Mm. My guys aren't going out clubbing in the college, they're staying at home and using the internet. And in one sense, that's safer. In another sense, it's so isolating. Mm -hmm. When they finally do decide they want to talk to a real girl, many of my college men have not the faintest clue how to do it. Mm -hmm. Because they've never had to do it. Mm -hmm. And notice the cost benefit of going on an actual date is very high. You go on an actual date, what are the odds the girl will like you? 50-50? Uh, and if she does like you, how long until she'll want to you know, be with you? And how much will you have to talk? And how much will you have to expose who you are as a person? Notice all of these skills are skills that we learn on the playground in some ways, in a preparatory way. So even family formation, uh, we have to work very hard as a school to become intentionally interpersonal yeah, yeah. and make as much of what we're doing a conversation mm -hmm. and a human uh, and a creating thing, not a consuming thing. Mm -hmm. uh, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, sorry to interrupt. <clears throat> um, I'm just really curious about um, 
I think we, we all agree with this. You put it in a much more eloquent way than any of us could be, but I think we have a consensus uh, about every single element of what you pointed out and, and the structure in it is really useful to see. But before you fly back to Texas, I'd really like to ask about um, the content of your education. Mm -hmm. so we don't have the great books, uh, a school of thought, or we don't basically even know what it is, or classical education, or just tell us a little bit uh, um, what the uh, what the lessons look like, or what what how is it structured the curriculum. So one thing you can do is our website's becoming more and more complete, and go there, mm -hmm. uh, Saintconstantine.org. But let me be very concise and say we're language centered. So uh, this school already does this. But for an American school, it's unusual. We introduce multiple languages starting in first grade. So you can do some Greek, some Latin, some Arabic, some French, and some Spanish right away. Yes. And so we start this very early uh, with choices. Um, here, you're multilingual uh, commonly. In the United States, being bilingual is very unusual unless you're born that way, you know, in a family that's bilingual. Almost no Americans are bilingual. I, unfortunately, I'm not in a fluent way because you're just not educated that way. And so we've gone the other way. We're very language centered. But even for our English language instruction, which is most of the instruction we do, uh, we're very text centered, but also very experiential centered. Mm -hmm. So the preserved stuff we do, notice the difference between live and preserved, tends to be books as opposed to video. Our assumption is that every other kind of recorded or preserved thing other than books, they'll get naturally more than they need. And they'll get visual flu fluency and education in that. Now I started a film program, an actual film program to make movies. Uh, if you go watch Challenger Disaster uh, from the year 2019, it was made by the film program I started. So I, I like people who make movies. I like having people think, my daughter's in it briefly. You can see her walking through. Uh, she did the sets, uh, the set design, and got a cameo. Uh, so I'm not opposed to film, right? But my, what I figure is my kids, my students, K through college, will get a lot of it. So the curriculum is very linguistically and experientially centered. If we can do it or make it, with our students, we do it or make it. If we must, we'll read about it in the younger grades. So we have something called the Liturgy of the Good Shepherd, which was uh, yeah, a Roman exactly. Cat uh, Catechism of the Good Shepherd, I'm sorry, which was a Roman Catholic program that our Metropolitan Joseph, when he was my bishop in Los Angeles, adapted for the Orthodox community, where uh, we work all the students through uh, the liturgy by doing. Uh, they make candles, uh, they make holy bread that we actually use in the Eucharist uh, in the end. They learn all the prayers. Now, we're a multi-denominational school. Uh, we have, for example, Mormon children who now know the entire creed of the Orthodox Church. <laughs> parents put up with this. But uh, why? Because it's, it's learning. So instead of teaching them about, we as much as possible have them doing and creating uh, K through 6. As a result, we don't give homework K through six uh, because what we want them. We don't uh, K through six. Yeah, what age? Is that? uh, that's about uh, four in our context Two, to about twelve. 12. So no homework from four. Yeah, uh, and many of our parents get upset about this uh, because they feel like their students will get behind. Uh, one advantage we have is that our high school is uh, does so well. Uh, one of our high school students were very new just won the state of Texas poetry competition. So uh, no one doubts that our high school is rigorous, so they trust us in the elementary school. We actually say to them, this is true, our students, if you went from our sixth grade to a very, very good sixth grade, the best in Texas, they might be a little academically behind. Is that the 11 to 12? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, but if they transferred out in eighth grade, they would be ahead. Because our students do what we view as age-appropriate things, K through six, that are very hands-on, very learning, and we don't burn them out. We let them be children. Mm -hmm. We have lots of recess. Mm -hmm. uh, if they get antsy, our teachers are empowered to take them outside. So mm -hmm. if their class is antsy, and just let them run for a little while mm -hmm. uh, and burn off energy. Mm -hmm. uh, um, 
energetic. They're unable to sit still. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, colloquialisms are a Texas habit. <laughs> um, so that, if you look at the, the K through six curriculum, uh, it's a lot of language introduction, um, basic numeracy, lots of books and stories of fairy tales, and we try to plunge as deeply into authentic local culture as we can mm -hmm. to lay down roots. So our curriculum would look different here than it does there. And we're going to open a school in Pennsylvania, uh, and it will look very different there, K through six, because we'll look for authentic connections to the region that we're in for children. Uh, the activities you can do outside are different in Pennsylvania. It snows than they are in Houston. Um, and then seven through 12. I think sixth grade, they start the great books. Yeah, sixth grade, but more in seventh grade, yeah. really. Mm -hmm. uh, the centerpiece of our education is dialectical discussion. Mm -hmm. So I, I know this is weird to say, but I have led discussions on Plato's Phaedrus with seventh graders. What age is that? Uh, 12, 13. Okay, yeah. Um, they're not very good discussions uh, compared to our college students. They're about 10 minutes of very good discussion. Mm. And the rest of it is my prodding them, they're saying insane things that mm. it reminded them of a TV show they saw. Mm. And we guide it, right? It's not, it's not just a waste of time. Mm. By the time those students are in 12th grade, uh, last year, beyond <coughs> two students that went to our own college, we sent a student to be a physics major at Rice University, which is the best university in Texas, uh, NASA. It powers a lot of the space program. <coughs> so we sent a student out of our little school to there. Uh, basically, every good university in Texas has a St. Constantine student in it right now. Mm -hmm. And we are not selective. <coughs> We're in the center of the city. We admit any student, regardless of their academic ability or their ability to pay, and in the US context, this is very important, we're exceedingly racially diverse. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are, uh, for example, we would, we would be able to apply for federal grant money. Uh, so many of our students have to eat subsidized lunches. Mm -hmm. So enough of our students come from very low socioeconomic levels that our students, our school could be classified as a poverty serving school. We also serve children of billionaires. Uh, so that's a very unusual thing, but here's my point. The results of this long conversation is generally to produce a kind of student who's more likely to stay in the church because their first questions came in a Christian context that wasn't tyrannical and guiding. Second, their academic achievement is far greater within their own ability levels than if we didn't do this. Uh, and this centers around a slow exposure to the great books of the uh, Western. And here's the trick. As far as I know, we're the only school that does extensive Eastern Christian readings. Because we're centered in the Orthodox Church, uh, we read writings from the great Orthodox communities of Aksum, Ethiopia, or the Syrian Church or the Russian church, surely, uh, and a lot of Greek. In fact, uh, we have Greek philanthropists that looked at our curriculum, and we probably read more Greek texts than most Greek schools uh, in the United States. And so this kind of broad cultural exposure helps our students excel, and that's the center of everything we do. The center of everything we do is dialectic, dialogue, uh, starting in seventh grade. So that's five or six? Um, so 7th, 8th, 9th, 12th, all the way through high school. 7th grade is how old? Uh, 12. About 12. So you start this dialectic yes. approach it, when they're 12? Yes. What was my next question, actually? Do you do that younger? No. Uh, for the most part, what we do is read with them and fill their heads with as much knowledge, factual knowledge, as their little heads can take. Uh, because they like doing that at that age. This is a lot of memorizing? Uh, yeah. Like first grade. Yeah. Learning by heart. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, in the United States, a great way to learn American history is to memorize all the American presidents so that when you get to a different era, you have a little closet to hang the facts on 
uh, little hangers. All this happened in the Grant administration. Most of our presidents aren't very important, but <coughs> knowing when they lived gives you a kind of timeline to work with. And so our kids work a lot with timelines who are small. Um, I'm just trying to imagine why yeah. those videos. I don't know anything. I didn't know anything about this school before, and I can see a little bit of, uh, I'll say, like Waldorf education, like what kind yes. of research outside, yes. making everything yourself, yes. the story. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but, do you give Do you give grades? Uh, yeah, that's a good question, which I will answer. But you were saying a very important thing. Our parents who know Waldorf or Montessori always think that we're Waldorf or Montessori, so we have to warn them ahead of time that we're not. Uh, because what we've done, so this is a very funny thing, we're college administrators who took all the best research that we could find uh, to produce a, a primary school. And so we're a little bit of everything, uh, and so sometimes classical schools in the United States, that's kind of a brand, uh, don't think we're classical. Uh, but then I don't think most classical schools are classical <laughs> because they'll end up with nobody at the school that's actually competent in, let's say, Plato. Uh, they just have a name brand that's classical and they buy classical textbooks, whatever that means. Uh, and so this is a deep pedagogy that we think is drawn on the best scientific research currently mm -hmm. and, and the deep classical education that one can find in Oxbridge Mason. Running all the yes, of course. Yeah. Charlotte Mason is a very big figure in our world, all the way back to Constantinople. So we trace it all the way back to Constantinople and the university there. But notice that means we don't quite fit into any. You know, Charlotte Mason uh, had lots of good ideas, so we accidentally look a lot like a Charlotte Mason yeah, school. Uh, so, for example, uh, I often ask a parent who comes to us. We had a parent who wanted to donate all smart uh, blackboards to our school. That's like tens of thousands of dollars worth of technology. And I would have taken it, I'm not opposed to it, I think they're fun. I, I grew up on Star Trek, so it would be fun. I want one in my office um, <laughs> just to play with it. But what I asked was for research, peer-reviewed research showing that that would improve the educational quality in our classrooms. Yeah. And the minute I asked that question, everyone went away. When a salesperson comes to our school and has something new technology or curriculum to show us, our first question is, can you show us peer-reviewed that that's wasn't that's paid for by question. you? That's like music to my ears as an educational yeah. psychologist, you know, because that's what I tell my students all the time. Where's the literature? Where's the research that shows this is effective? I mean, constantly when I'm lecturing, I ask them, so if anyone suggests to you like an approach, an educational approach, you need to know what the literature reviews are. You need to know what the meta-analysis says. We got rid of um, entire parts of most high schools. For example, we don't have a, a, an officer to help students prepare to apply to college. And parents come and they would like, I would make money if I had one because it would make our parents happy. But whenever I'm asked about it, I, I point out that the research shows that it doesn't help. Uh, all we've done is spend money placating the parents uh, but it doesn't help your kid get into college. We know how to help your kid get into college, and that isn't the way to do it. Uh, and so if you'll trust us and trust the research, we can help your kid get into college. And we try to drive everything that way. And so in some ways, that makes us very modern, right? Uh, very responsive. But since so far, technology hasn't turned out to show good educational benefits, the neutral at best, and it's very expensive, we've tended not to use it. Now, of course, our students use, you know, you have computers here, laptops. Of course, our students use word processors, you know, to write their papers. And, you know, they do that at school. Uh, and we monitor it. And, of course, they, you know, do what you do here. And, and of course, they use Excel and, and the tools that they're going to use in the real world. Uh, we're not, again, Luddites. But what's the best thing? How do you have a good school? Hire a good teacher who loves the students and leave them alone uh, to teach as much as possible. So our teachers are also radically empowered. Um, how many administrators do we have that don't teach? It's a negation question. How many of our, how many people teach at our school? Of all the employees, what percent? 100%? Yes. Because you're modeling it. Yeah. Yes, we don't have, I teach. 
Uh, the last four days were difficult because I had to rearrange my schedule, but I will go back next week and I will spend all of Tuesday leading a seminar, I mean all of Tuesday, on City of God, and I will spend all of Thursday leading a seminar on Brothers K, sadly in English. So we need some of you to come and lead Brothers Karamazov seminars in Russian and help us all. Uh, uh, we began uh, four years ago, so we are still relatively small. We have 250 students K through college, so K through 16, we call it. For what level is these children in our mostly? Um, every level. We have about the same number, about 15 in every level, okay. uh, mm -hmm. all the way through seniors in college. We'll have three students who will graduate from the college this year mm -hmm. with a baccalaureate degree in English. I uh, and I uh, hopefully one of them will marry my son. But <laughs> he, he hasn't asked yet, so <laughs> we'll see. And how old is the school? Uh, we're four years old. Four, okay. Yeah, um, we'll be three hundred. We already have three hundred students registered uh, for the fall of next year. Um, we intentionally only grow about fifty a year because we don't want to sink the ship, and we don't have enough space. Have you special needs children? Yes. Uh, on uh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the only place that so far, because of finances, uh, we uh, have to tell people that if you, we have lots of one-on-one -on -one education, and we do have um, special needs specialists who come to the school because the state of Texas actually pays for this uh, with students with special needs, but you have to be a student that can be mainstreamed. But for example, one of our college um, I want to be careful how I say this, because uh, we're on a tape. Uh, but I think this is okay. Um, one of our college freshmen is uh, profoundly blind, uh, for example. Uh, you know, they uh, do, we're a great text college, and they do all their reading and discussion via Braille uh, and by uh, audio technology. Yeah. We had another student uh, who suffered from encephalitis as a, a young person. And we have dealt with that yeah. student and, and be able to help them. Yeah, but the uh, blind children are quite easy. Uh, yes, no, Compare that's true. Is, uh, psychiatric children. Yes. yes, yes, we do have those students as well. And mm -hmm. as long as they are, we cannot deal with every student. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some students that need profound help. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a high school student, for example, uh, that transferred to us from another school. And I think that because we had one on one help for them, we help them a lot, but then we recommended to the parents that they transfer to an even more specialized school. Mm -hmm. So if you can be mainstreamed some of the time, uh, we can generally help you. Uh, you know, if you have reading difficulties or something, uh, we can help you. E even if you keep reading difficulties, we have students, for example, that will never learn to write conventionally. Mm -hmm. And we can help, you know, get alternative ways of uh, communicating and help teach those. Uh, but we're not, you know, not on the whole, uh, for a student with profound issues, we can't help the them. The number of autistic children at ADG is growing. Yes. 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 Uh, all, all, many of our students are somewhere, if you'll allow me this informal phrase, on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a psychologist, so I, I hate using <laughs> psychological terms. But we have, I don't know why, but in the 30 years I've taught, uh, we've gone from having very few children that would be on the spectrum uh, to very many, especially amongst our gifted and talented students. Uh, this is a question. Uh, yeah. 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 So, some investigations what uh, shows us that uh, uh, when society um, uh, is changing, Mm -hmm. So the mode of raising children is, say, uh, is changing, and children have very many contacts in early ch childhood. Mm -hmm. Then it makes them uh, behave differently and feel differently. Mm -hmm. So that I think that it is reality that we will get some more and more. Uh, that's our experience, and so we have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. I, 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 yeah, I think I can say this too. I don't want to share too much because a student will be listening uh, and they always think it's them that I'm talking about, but these are hundreds of students, so it's not one student. But over, I taught um, gifted and talented college students for 17 years. By the time I ended, 
a lot of what we did was send them to the Rosemead School of Psychology to get help. Uh, we were almost a way of therapy uh, because so many of our gifted and talented students in the United States uh, were severely depressed. Um, in fact, I would say one of the biggest outcomes of what I've been talking about is depression. So uh, more and more of our students, and, and I'm sorry, I, I don't know what's appropriate, so I'll just say what I find. Our students are struggling with cutting themselves. Yeah, it's a lot in the UK. Yeah, I would and about... Um, Loneliness and isolation. One in three of our uh, women, girls, have eating disorders, and about one in ten of our boys. It's rising faster amongst our boys. It's kind of tapped off with girls. Like one in three is so terrible that one in four are somewhere in there. I mean, uh, and so, uh, but the other thing that I don't know how I can communicate to parents, the only thing I sometimes suggest to parents is they adopt an identity of a kid their child's age and go onto social media and find out what happens. Mm -hmm. just, just do it. And often for my parents, they stop letting their child use social media. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the themes that you're touching on um, resonate with Reynolds' talk this morning, you know, you talk about connection mm -hmm. and belonging, and like yes. what you can do as parents and teaching as an educators to um, connect emotionally with our children um, and give them a sense of belonging, both of the church and the home, the school and the, and the wider church community. Um, so it's, it's interesting kind of what you touched on there in terms of also incidents of um, self-harm as well that we see also in the UK. Um, I was wondering if I could ask a slightly different question. Um, you've obviously got a huge experience from a teaching background before you set the uh, band of this school, the orphan yeah. school. Um, I was curious to know, um, in terms of the curriculum that's orthodox, so you talked about um, <coughs> so children question. having yeah, so, uh, the text that they might read. Um, did you have some, um, some theological uh, advisors or some, uh, who, who was it that kind of advised the school <coughs> on which particular texts were appropriate for children of different ages? I'm, I'm kind of really curious about so that. So the majority, majority of our board are priests uh, mm -hmm. and we have uh, very highly skilled and educated uh, people, including my brother actually, has a theological background. But I wanna say, 80% of our students are not orthodox. Okay, interesting. And uh, not an insignificant number of our students come from atheistic backgrounds. So Houston has a lot of Chinese uh, people that come because of the space program and because of the oil industry. And they'll come to our school because of the high academic standards. And we tell them, we're an Orthodox school. You're going to go to chapel every day. But we don't, we're Orthodox, so we don't proselytize. But if your kid ends up being Orthodox, don't blame us. You know, we won't, that just, it's who we are. Um, but the curriculum I described to you and the approach means we don't have religion class. We don't have any Orthodox classes at all. And for some of our Orthodox parents, it, it, it they become upset. You're in an Orthodox school. We pervade yeah, yeah. with the reading list and the activities of the school. We live out Orthodoxy. But this is, I tried to express this yesterday. This is so important and it's so Orthodox. We are not a parish school. Mm -hmm. We are not controlled by the church. Mm -hmm. And that is the Orthodox way of setting up education. Um, we're in a different political context, but the emperor paid for the schools, not the bishop. Mm -hmm. So our school is lay run, but orthodox, because we're in a republic, you know, not an empire, but the laity pays for the school, including through tuition, and controls it, and the priests uh, serve as a board that can veto any doctrinal changes to the school, but have no control over the curriculum. Can you say that again? So the priests are can they, they are a majority of the board, and they can absolutely veto any deviation from the doctrine, you know, doctrinal positions of the school or the moral positions, but they have no control over the curriculum whatsoever. Uh, this is what I was trying to express yesterday, so I want to be clear on this. This makes all the difference in the world. Mm 
The separation of school and church okay. is an orthodox assumption. We didn't, after all, even have seminaries in the orthodox world until very late in time. Our priests were formed how? Out of monasteries. And schools, notice we're a church of education. We had free primary education for many of the people in the Eastern Roman Empire, including women, which is unusual. And we kept a continuous secular university tradition from the beginning of the Eastern Roman Empire, with very few exceptions, it's going to be hard times, to 1453. We were studying Plato as Orthodox Christians for a thousand years and advancing knowledge and creating secular art through secular schools in the sense that they weren't controlled by the church. Um, this is not then to be nominal or not holy or not religious. No one comes to our school and thinks we're not Orthodox. Our bishops are very happy. But we also, um, so how do we teach science? Uh, we teach science as main uh, mainstream scientists uh, have conclusions, but then we also teach philosophy of science that suggests that the mainstream conclusion of today might be overturned you know, in a hundred years. Uh, so how does this church teaching fit with mainstream science today? Uh, we're not sure. Uh, you should wonder about that. And maybe if you think about it, you'll come up with a solution. But after all, when the church was born, Aristotle taught that women weren't human. The church taught that men and women were created in the image of God. How did those two things fit together? Here's what best reason was teaching us, and here's what the faith taught us. Uh, what did the church do? They said, uh, we'd sort of like to agree with Aristotle, but we can't. So we waited. Anybody who tried to solve it quickly, we're embarrassed of, no. You know, they, they did embarrassing or evil things. But eventually the tension was resolved, in this case, by showing that Aristotle was wrong. Mm -hmm. Women are not defective men, biologically. I, I apologize for even saying that, right? I, if anything, men are defective women. I, I, right, this was a tension. And the church lived with it. And so we do the same thing. Uh, what does best mainstream science teach? Great, we teach that. Uh, how does that fit with the church? We teach the controversy. Uh, we don't know, we will say to older kids. But we know this, the church isn't always wrong, even the church's interpretation if we wait long enough. So be patient. Uh, how does this help our students? They don't go to college or university or grad school, and the first time they run into a problem that they can't easily resolve or doesn't agree with their priest, they don't leave the faith. In the United States, if you're Orthodox, about 50% of our young adults leave church after the age of 18, never to return. Over half. That's the lowest number I've ever heard. It could be as high as 80%. But I'm using the lower number. Um, if you educate this way, our experience, and this is after 30 years, is that about 85% of students will be in the church. Um, why? Uh, they're good kids. They don't want to make their parents sad, and the church is great. It works. It has a deep culture. I mean, uh, how can you understand the history of Estonia, for example, without understanding the history of the Lutheran church? How can you understand the history of Estonia without understanding the Orthodox Church? And I can keep going, you know, Christianity is deeply woven into the very fabric of this nation, historically. So if you can make it work, why wouldn't you? Um, the problem is, if we make it so that there's one package of answers a student has to buy, the whole package, to be any kind of Christian, the minute they can't buy one piece of the package, and in the world of the internet, there'll always be people attacking pieces of the package, their faith will be brittle and snap. Um, why do we let kids play a lot? Because it turns out that playing and falling a lot strengthens your bones. 
so that our playground has fewer serious accidents than safer playgrounds in the city of Houston. Because our students, when they fall down older ages, are actually less likely to have horrible injuries. Why? They've been falling down and roughing around for years. Uh, this is just conclusive, research-wise. Mm -hmm. And so our parents get used to it, right? Kid comes up a little scraped or banged up. The playground is safe, right? We came to recognize there's risk, and then there are hazards. Do you want hazards on your playground? No. Sharp objects people can run into, uh, things that are truly dangerous. But risk is something you want to learn a, a kid to deal with. We have a little girl who starts to climb a tree, and she gets to a height where she's afraid and stops. That's good. The next year, she comes back to the same tree. This is a real child, and goes a little higher, and then stops. She's learned to adjust her fear to appropriate risk, and then once she falls out of the tree and lands in our safe zone, right, that we have built, what happens? She learns that she doesn't die, right? And, that, and, and maybe even she's banged up a little bit, but she learns to balance risk and reward and become courageous. And uh, this is a, a real kid, and I've seen this kid grow. And, and it's exciting. Now, what does this have to do with your soul? I think your soul is like that. Uh, we have kids as early as seventh, eighth, ninth grade reading difficult books that aren't always very Christian. And then we wrestle with them with these ideas and they get a little banged up and they think and some things they think it's hard for them to understand. And then by the time they're in 12th grade, they've grown some muscle. Mm -hmm. So real story, one of my students is an Orthodox Christian, but they have a relative, I won't say how close, who is a very virulent atheist who would come to family parties and gatherings and um, make everyone feel foolish every year because they're a very well-educated person. Um, this uh, young man, I think he was in 11th grade, and his sister, who had gone to our school, he began to talk about his ideas. They responded to his ideas from what they had learned in class for themselves and silenced him. For the first time. Mm -hmm. Not in a, a bad, disrespectful way, mm -hmm. but suddenly this person, uh, they had heard all those ideas before. Yeah. Only better versions of it. And so they actually said to the uh, relative, if you're going to be an atheist, you should read this book, not what you're saying. <laughs> because this is it's shallow. Fantastic. Uh, and it was, it was very good. But notice it wasn't disrespectful. It wasn't but they had put on some muscle so they were no yeah. longer intimidated. Yeah. It's very similar to what Father, Father Patrick Tischel, uh, he says similar things, you know, as an Orthodox educator as yourself around, you know, what we should be more, um, as Orthodox parents and teachers, that our children will go out into the world and that they will, that atheists will, you know, that, that rather than be fearful that their children will lose their faith, actually the other way, that the ones around them will, what is it they have? Yes. What is it about these Orthodox children that they can like dialogue the way that you say and that they can articulate their faith in a way that they're not fearful of the secular culture that they encounter? It's, it's just it's, right. it's important to distinguish. Notice our secular can... notice our secular students though our non-Orthodox Christian students mm -hmm. uh, don't feel threatened. They feel at home. Mm -hmm. uh, many of my teachers aren't Orthodox themselves and don't feel like second-class citizens. Most of my teachers, in fact, are orthodox. Most of my cabinet is an orthodox. The vice presidential level people, there are about six of us, and there are two orthodox people, including me. Uh, but they feel comfortable. Yes, I know it's that time. Much. I have it. Yeah, and yeah. we're at 322. I think we're done at 330. Is that correct, or are we over time? I, I don't, time does not exist, but I'll check. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to have been rude to someone else. I become very interested in the topic, uh, maybe more than you, but uh, I care.
But I, I want to say this, we've made very practical at the deepest levels, like how we do art uh, and you know, have thought it down as carefully as we could. But we're not always right. And so one thing, you know, I just walk around looking at the school learning. I really like the fact that every homeroom teacher is continuously in their room, assigned to a room. We wouldn't be able to do that yet because we don't have enough rooms, but I will we'll think about it when we get to that point. So we know we don't have all the answers. Let me hasten to say one other thing. Um, we really believe in the model we're doing or we wouldn't be doing it. But we're also not <coughs> religious about it. Um, there are many, 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 many fine schools that don't do things the way we do them uh, curriculum-wise or stylistically. And we don't feel any need to condemn them uh, or uh, evangelize them in our way of doing it. Because notice the dialectic we believe in makes us unsure we're right. Uh, all the time, right? Like, oh, it's maybe the school is better than we are and we should learn from them. And, and we almost surely should. Uh, the other thing that's deeply true is I believe that you could have a very bad curriculum. Curriculum. And if you have very good teachers, it will be a very good school. Uh, and I think research shows that that's true. Mm -hmm. That in many ways, I spent a lot of time talking about the curriculum, mm -hmm. but one reason the St. Constantine School works well mm -hmm. is I spent 17 years teaching gifted and talented college students. So when we decided to start hiring teachers, I had a giant backlog of people to call. And so if you come to our school, um, why did we start a college? Because if you can hire a second grade teacher knowing that they might have to teach in the college, you hire a different sort of person. But notice if we hire a college teacher, Dr. Tim Bartell, who's a poet and an Orthodox Christian, is a PhD from St. Andrews in theology and literature. He'll often have to teach fifth graders. He mostly teaches our college students, but also teaches fifth graders. My CFO is an MBA from Darden, one of the better business schools in the United States, and she teaches seventh grade algebra in addition to running our finances. Uh, there's a reality that comes when I have to go give, before I left, uh, the day before I left, I think, I had to give a lecture on um, weathering heights to a group of 10th graders. Now, 10th graders don't care at all about my credentials, and they are not amused by my age, and they have uh, no natural respect for my position. They're good kids, but they're in 10th grade, which makes them naturally, in the United States anyway, dislike authority. Um, that's hard work. I'd much rather give a lecture to a graduate school. I can do that too. Uh, but it's good for me. Uh, because the other thing we believe at St. Constantine that I think is good uh, is that a kindergarten teacher is every bit the scholar educator as the university professor. But I have friends in the United States who will keep working part-time college jobs instead of teaching full-time at a high school because of the difference in prestige the kind of pride. Well, I teach college students. Um, when I decided to become president of the St. Constantine School, started, I had to give up the pride. I had been offered a regular college presidency. College is high school? Uh, no, college is university. university. Yeah, university. College is university. Okay. So I had been the chief academic officer at a university. Okay. And I was offered a university level presidency. To turn it down to do K through 16 meant that my friends thought I had disappeared, mm. that I had failed. Because the prestige of working inside a university system is, in the United States at least, much higher than teaching in a high school. So even though we had a college, I failed. Does that make sense? Like my career was going this way and I fell off the end of the career thing. This is, I think, quite evil. 
I actually think this is evil. I've said very few things are, yeah, it can be good, can be bad. I think this snobbery is harming us. Mm -hmm. I think a first grade teacher should be given the resources and respect we give a college professor. And one good thing about our school is that we do. Mm -hmm. Because this next week, someone who normally teaches fifth grade will teach in the college just as some of the people who normally teach in the college, like Dr. Bartell, often teach in the fifth grade. Which is harder? I don't know. I know this, I couldn't take a day in the nursery <laughs> where my daughter works. <laughs> yeah, I can take 10 minutes is bliss. <laughs> one last question if there is one, and then I know we should stop. It's that time, you're going to say stop. Well, uh, I think we need to finish Let the because, other room. Uh, there will be coffee at the end. And, and if I keep you from coffee, but we have two minutes? Two minutes, okay. Did you get a specific <laughs> enough answer to your question? I'm becoming more and more curious. Yeah. <laughs> no definite answer yet, but I want to definitely find we out more. We can talk more about it. Yeah, um, we'll yeah. about here's, but, No, I mean everything is... But, but really, here, yeah. here's, here's what really matters. Uh, we have a person uh, that picks the colors of every room. And we think about, so for example, think of everything we said. We think about, um, I'm sorry, I began to read your walls while I was here. Do you know a really great thing about your school? Your walls are very authentic to your own children. They're, they're like decorated with things your kids say and do. And so I think you're really great. Uh, and we think about this all the time because if we're not careful in the American context, we'll decorate our walls with stuff that our wealthy parents give us mm. instead of decorating it with art we've made. Mm. I mean, this is really good. I, I can't mm. tell you how much mm. the school encourages me, but don't, here's the problem. Most schools in the United States become worse after they're successful when you get your own home, when you're funded, when you're kind of making it, because you, you, cease, you cease to innovate mm. and create, and you fall exactly into the same pattern. Mm. I don't think we have a danger of that. Okay, good. <laughs> the lack of because, money. Uh, you know, like we have new, new, new horizons. Uh, new worlds to conquer. Our principle will yeah, <laughs> that's right. So that's good. Uh, God help us to yes. never think we're right. <laughs> yeah. uh, but notice, notice my own ideas mean I think my own ideas are questionable. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah.